Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. In the United States, the cost of college has skyrocketed over the past few decades. Since the 1980s, tuition fees and room and board have doubled at colleges and universities. That rate far outpaces both inflation and the growth of family incomes. The question is, what's driving up the cost? Greed, fancy amenities, endless construction, cheap state governments? Or is it simply a matter of economics? On average, people who go to college make substantially more money than those with just a high school degree. College isn't for everyone, of course, but the clear financial benefits, not to mention the social experience, has significantly increased enrollment. As demand for a college education has increased, so is the price. That's sort of basic economics. Professor Richard Vetter, an economist at Ohio University and author of Going Broke by Degree, Why College Costs Too Much, told me other industries have to innovate in order to cut costs. But colleges, he told me, have become lazy and soft when it comes to innovation because they don't experience that same market pressure to control price. Why not? Well, Vetter points to the billions of dollars flowing into the system every year from the federal government in the form of loans, grants, and tax benefits to students and their families. In turn, schools, especially private schools, realize that many students have this rich benefactor, i.e. Uncle Sam, so they keep upping the price. They can rip off students because the taxpayers are picking up the bill. Consider. A 2015 study out of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York found that for every dollar of subsidized federal loans, tuition went up about 60 cents. In other words, when the government gives a dollar to a student, it only reduces that student's tuition by 40 cents. The school captures that other 60 cents. This idea is consistent with something called the Bennett Hypothesis. Basically, Bennett argued that student aid gave universities license to increase tuition, and therefore, aid has counterintuitively made college less affordable. To be fair, this is a controversial hypothesis, and a sizable chunk of academic literature has challenged it. Professor Charlie Eaton, a sociologist at UC Merced, told me there are definitely problems with the Bennett hypothesis and the policy recommendations that often stem from it, like cutting aid. It ignores the fact that government regulations can impact how money is ultimately put to use, for instance. But Eaton did tell me that when the government made student loans more accessible in the early 1990s, it definitely had the effect of increasing tuition bills. So what's happening to all this extra money? Well, many folks point to administrative bloat. Basically, the number of non-instructors on college payrolls has rapidly grown over time. That's vice presidents, counselors, advisors, healthcare providers, administrative assistants, etc. Vetter said this has led to one of the great ironies of modern higher education. As tuition has gone up, the proportion of money spent on teaching has gone down. In the 1970s, about 40% of college budgets went to instruction. Today, that number is below 30%. And increasingly, it's not established tenure-track professors that are leading classrooms. Instead, it's underpaid adjuncts and part-timers so that well-paid superstar faculty members can focus on their research and talking on the phone with YouTube hosts. Anyway, another money drain for colleges potentially inflating the price? Amenities. In order to attract wealthy students who don't need aid and therefore pay the most real tuition dollars, colleges have embraced the bells and whistles of country clubs, rock walls, swimming pools, art collections, fancy dorms. After emerging from the recession, American colleges spent billions on construction projects, and the annual number keeps going up. And by the way, getting financing for these massive projects has left many schools in debt. On average, 9% of college and university budgets goes to servicing debt. In 2016, colleges and universities borrowed $41.3 billion through municipal bonds. That's up from $28.7 billion a decade ago. Eaton told me all this debt can put pressure on colleges to keep raising tuition. With Wall Street now invested in higher education, the fear is that decision-making will be motivated by bottom-line thinking and not what's best for the students. Okay, resetting here. So far, I've pinned the blame of rising college costs on greedy schools grabbing as much money as possible and wasting it on big administrative staffs and on boondoggles like lazy rivers and hot tubs. However, 
there's an alternative view. Professor David Feldman, an economist at William & Mary and co-author of Why Does College Cost So Much, told me it's easy to point to specific expenses on college campuses, like a sculpture or a well-paid president, and claim they're to blame for skyrocketing tuition. It's a simple narrative that the nuanced, deficient media loves to tell. But, he told me, administrative bloat and excessive amenities are not significant cost drivers in academia. Yes, there are more admins on campus, but that includes people in IT, which was simply not a consideration in yesteryear. Feldman told me that other non-instructional expenditures are just responses to modern standards of care. More young people today seek mental health services than before. Hence, there should be more mental health staff on campuses. Plus, a study out of the National Bureau of Economic Research shows that money spent on student support services like academic coaching can actually be more effective at increasing graduation rates than money spent on instruction. Okay, what about all these fancy amenities? Well, sure, some of them may be unnecessary, but Americans are a lot richer than we used to be. I mean, on average, at least. Per capita income has increased threefold since 1960, so it's no wonder we like nice, expensive things like fitness centers and campus movie theaters. This has driven up cost, and it's an easy target for critics and journalists, but in Feldman's view, the real culprit behind rising costs is plain, boring, unsexy economics. For instance, there's something called the cost disease, which definitely sounds unsexy and is unfortunately not the only disease spreading on college campuses. But I digress. Most sectors in the economy can become more productive over time, usually through innovation and increased efficiency. We can make everything from cars to computers faster and cheaper than before. But sectors afflicted with the cost disease don't really have the ability to be more productive, yet their cost still goes up. The classic example of cost disease is a professional string quartet. A hundred years ago, it was four people playing classical music. Today, it's four people playing the same classical music. The musicians haven't gotten more productive. Many of the songs are identical. The equipment is often the same, but they get paid more. Makes sense. 2018 musicians wouldn't be able to live on 1918 wages. That's the cost disease. Price goes up even when the product or service stays the same. It's an issue to varying degrees with a lot of service industries, everything from massages to dental visits. Feldman told me it's also the case with colleges. A professor stands at the front of a room and teaches a group of students. There's not a ton of improvement possible there. The model works as is. And since professors tend to be highly educated people who could command high salaries elsewhere, schools have to keep giving them raises to retain them on staff. I push back on this notion a little bit. Can't colleges improve productivity, I asked Feldman, by simply increasing class size? He told me that larger class sizes actually diminish the product, i.e. education, so you can't really call that increased productivity. How about online classes, I countered. Can't that be an innovation that lowers costs? Feldman said the evidence so far on online classes is not great. They're more expensive to operate than you realize, and typical college students don't get a lot out of them. They're more effective for older folks. Feldman's arguments are compelling, for sure, but they're also a little frustrating. I mean, he essentially argues the cost of college is increasing because it's inevitable. Okay, but it's still a major issue. 61% of Americans think college is headed in the wrong direction, and the number one reason why is cost. So how do we fix this? Well, state governments can start shipping in more. The amount of money states have given to public schools on a per-student basis has decreased over time, and students have had to make up the difference. In 1988, students provided about a third as much revenue to public schools as state and local governments did. Today, students and state and local governments provide about the same amount. Finally, Feldman said the big issue impacting college affordability is income distribution in America. The gap between the rich and the poor is growing. Wages have been virtually stagnant for decades. If our national economic gains were shared more evenly, then the rising cost of college would be more palatable for most of us. Perhaps then, student loans also wouldn't be that much of a burden. And if that massive national debt was alleviated in some way, that would impact everything from the housing market to marriage rates. In other words, a lot is at stake. A lot can improve if wages go up and college feels more affordable. Of course, 
Schools could do better at managing costs, like construction and staffing. Efficiency and accountability regulations can be tied to government loans and grants. Governments could devote more and smarter resources to higher education. And maybe that will finally start happening when the student loan generation starts filling the halls of Congress and the White House. Okay, I'm going to go live my life. Booyakasha! <laughs> Professor G in the house, all right? It costs $38,000 a year to go to Harvard. With that money, you could have bought a top-of-the-range Lexus. But instead, you chose to invest in your kid's future. Is you mental? 